Um, so let's get started, because this is what I want to talk to you about, how we use data analytics in soccer. Because it's been a big boom over the last um, four or five years with data analysis, performance analysis, statistical analysis, um, specifically in soccer. I'm sure you've seen social media, Twitter, everybody, there's loads of, lots of bloggers talking about how we use statistics, how we use data an analytics. But I want to talk to you about how we use it here at NYCFC. Um, and basically, I'm going to take you, just talk to you a little bit about the history of statistics and data and where we're at now. Because uh, there's two types that we've used, physical data and technical data. I'm predominantly, predominantly on the technical side, but physical data is where, as a sport, we feel like we've mastered. So physical data, I'm sure you've heard of uh, GPS. So how far a player's ran, uh, what intensity has a player ran at, how long has a player ran for, how many accelerations, how many decelerations, how many times have they jumped, landed, hit the floor. All this kind of physical data we feel like we've mastered. Um, and that's been through the use of um, GPS, heart rate data. Um, I'll give you an example of how we use it. For instance, if a player got injured and had a, a muscular injury, a hamstring injury, we could go back over the, the period of time just before their injury and we can look what did that player actually do? How long did he run for? What kind of um, physical load did he put on his body that may have helped him um, have that injury, occur, that injury occur? We can look at that um, time frame, maybe six, seven, eight weeks before, we can see what that player did. And during our training phases, we can go back and we can see and track, okay, we might be at a level where this player could be at risk again. So we could manage um, this player's specific training load during this week, two week, three week period. So from a physical perspective, we never, um, we never eradicate the chance of injury, but we can try and minimalize it and help this player progress through a specific training phase that he may have, may come, um, have a recurring injury, try and prevent that. From a technical side of things, we have, um, we're not, we get into a, a stage where we have access to lots of different data. Has everybody heard of uh, Opta Sports? Yeah, Opta? No, so for those who don't know, Opta are a, um, a statistical company who basically watch our games and they code our games just from a statistical perspective. They take um, information on every single event on the field. So a pass, a shot, um, a throw in, a tackle. They code everything and they produce the, the data, quantities, quantitative, uh, quantitative analysis um, of everything that's happened on the field. So that is the type of data that I use and what we use to produce our statistical analysis and our data analysis as well. Um, so for me, this is my definition of my role from a data perspective. So it's bringing an objectivity and a predictability to what I believe is one of the most fluid sports in the world and one of the most opinionated sports in the world. So I'm sure everybody in the room today has a, an opinion on how NYCFC played last game. Were we good, were we bad? Was there somebody who was uh, a player that was particularly strong, weak? Uh, did we attack well, did we defend well? Everyone's got an opinion. And it's the same with fans, with everybody in the press, in the media, with coaches, with analysts, with, within families, people who support one team, another team, everyone's got an opinion. So for me, my role, I see it's important to bring an objectivity um, to kind of help people's opinions, support people's opinions, and see what has actually happened from a, a different angle, from a very objective angle. So that's how, I see, that's how I see my role, what I can produce and what I can bring from a data perspective and from a video perspective as well. So, statistics and analytics. Um, I want to talk about the differences. Is there any statisticians or mathematicians or who were, anybody who works in data analysis in the room? Yeah? Can you tell me what you do? Can you share what you do? Or can you share what you feel the differences are? You know, Joe, we, I work on the, in the legal realm, and we deal with uh, getting uh, uh, data and analyzing it for uh, not only statistical models, but predictions, or just uh, understanding the data that we have in general. Perfect. Excellent. Is anybody else? No? Yes? Perfect. Okay, that's good. No, so for me, I was, from a soccer perspective, we have spent a lot of time looking at statistics and not as much time looking at analytics. So you may have seen um, on social media at the end of games, there's lots of total passes, uh, total successful passes, how many passes forward, how many shots, how many um, goals, these types of statistics. For me, we've not looked at analytics. 
And this is what the main part of my talk, my presentation, will be about the differences between statistics and the differences between um, analytics. So from here, <clears throat> this is from one of our games this season. And what, in this room, what do you think this data tells us? Have a little look at it. Look at it for yourselves. What do you, your opinion, what, what could have happened in this game? What could have gone on? Say again, sorry? Very dominant. Team B was very dominant. One quote. Would you agree with that? Yeah. yeah. Is there anything else that you could take from it apart from the overall dominance or perspective dominance of the team? Yeah, Say again, sorry? Can't tell who won the game. You can't tell who won the game because I've hit the score. That's true. Who do you think won the game? <laughs> team B? It's Team A. <laughs> so Team A won the game. So this is actually one of our games this season. Um, my next question is, which team do you think NYCFC is? Team B. Team B? Have you told him? Because that's going to be my next question. Which team is NYCFC? And if you're really good, which team is it that um, we played against? And yeah, it's Orlando City when we played them at home, first game of the season. Okay, so this was, our, this was some of the basic data uh, statistical analysis that we did. Um, for this game, the first game of the season that we played, and as an example, just a real basic statistical overview of the game. So, well done, I'm really impressed. I didn't think anybody would get that. I thought I was being really clever when I picked that game. Okay, so my next question is do we need to question this data previously? We looked at the score of the game, just an obvious question. Do you think we need to question this data? I think we do because we've lost the game, <coughs> but allegedly or statistically, we've been really, really dominant in every, in every aspect of being in possession, out of possession. Um, in possession, 60, nearly 70%, double the passes, penalty box entries, nearly double, shot, shots on target, shots inside the box, eight compared to this. So we still lost the game. How did we lose the game? Why did we lose the game? And we're going to question. So I'm asking you your opinion now. Can we make, just looking at this as a, from an analyst perspective, do you think looking at this is enough to make tactically imp help tactically improve the team or to help inform and make decisions? No? Why, do you, why is that? Need more historical data? Definitely. Any other reasons? No? Okay, so... Yeah, definitely. We need, some, need more historical data just to look back and see where we are, um, like I said, historically. But for me, just looking on a very singular level, these figures, these uh, variables, just describe what's happened. There's no kind of underlying um, theory. There's no underlying explanation. We need to delve deeper into this. We can use it as a, as a good starting point to see, OK, we've been dominant, but how we use it as a guide as a guy, there's no real kind of um, meaning, meaning behind them. And that's how I see statistics. And that's why I feel as a, as a sport, soccer has kind of, we've been put back a couple of years because we've been so focused on statistics. And they've been, they've been looked at so much in the media. They've been, they've been built up so much. When really we needed to look at data analytics and we needed to use these variables to help do this, like you alluded to before, create predictability. Look at it and get some more um, insight into what is actually going on. And analytics, for me, is helping us do that. And we're, we're scratching the surface. We're scratching the surface with what we're doing at the minute. And we're scratching the surface, but we're, um, we're at a point, using the data that we have, we're at a point where we can now substanti substantially say we can do this. Because from an analytical perspective, we have the systems in place where every, for example, every event that happens on the field, we can quantify. And we can quantify in relation to scoring and conceding goals. Because ultimately, that's what we want to do as a team. My job is to try and help my team score more goals than the opponent scores against us, to help win, get three points. So every event on the field, no matter if it's uh, Sean Johnson putting the ball down for a goal kick and passing to the right to Fred Brion or Max Chino or RJ Allen or whoever it might be, that has a quantitative, um, you can put a quantitative value on that to what might, might happen 
going forward. So if you move into the attacking third, it might be Maxi Morales beats a player 1v1 and slides a through ball to David Villa running into the box. That might have a bigger, um, that'll have a bigger value of a pass than the pass from Sean Johnson to, to Fred. So we're now starting to be able to, to quantify everything that we can do and its effect and its influence on subsequent play and subsequent possession. And this is the one value that we've been looking at a lot this season. Has anybody heard of this, expected goals? You've heard of it? What's your understanding of expected goals? You want to take the presentation? Oh. <laughs> sure. <laughs> no. But that's basically spot on. So expected goals, what is it? It's hit the nail on the head pretty much there. So expected goals looks at shots, and it looks at opta uh, coded shots over a million, nearly a million and a half shots in the opta database. And it looks at the location on the field, the type of shot, was it a header, was it a volley, was it um, weak foot, right foot, left foot? How did it originate? Was it from a cross, was it from a through ball, was it from... Um, a, counter, a quick counter-attack, a slow counter-attack, slow build-up play. It looks at all these different variables, and it puts them together, we term um, a, reg a regression analysis. So we look at the comparative value of every, the relate comparative relationships between all these variables and its effect, and how do, how do they relate? How do they compare and work and interact with each other? So this type of analysis to get an expected goals. So this means for every shot, we can assign a value. How likely is that shot or that attempt to a, result in a goal or a goal conceded. What it doesn't do though, what it doesn't do, and obviously as analysts we need to look at the limitations as well as everything that we can do and we need to understand these limitations. And the limitations of the expected goals is, I'll give you an example, if Jack Harrison goes down the right hand side and puts a cross in with his right foot, although he's not really likely to do it, um, and it goes right, sorry Jack, it goes right across the six yard box and there's nobody there in front of the goal to tap it into an empty net because the goalkeeper's dived and the ball's gone past him. If nobody's there and that shot doesn't happen, there's nobody there to take the shot, we, can't, we don't quantify that and qualify that with an expected goal because a shot didn't happen. So that's one of the limitations. But for me, it's not one of the major ones as there's a reason tactically behind there wasn't a player in that um, position to have that shot. Okay, if that makes sense. What else it doesn't account for, and this is probably the major limitation for me, is the teammates, defenders, goalkeepers, the location of them, who's in front of the player when they've taken the shot. We're not looking at the player's their location of the in, in position if I were to shoot and you were to block it, we're not taking that into account. Okay? Which is probably the major limitation, but for what we have got and what we do and how we've checked it and how reliable this um, and how substantial expected goals has been, we can't eradicate it, but we're taking it into account and we're working to make this a part of this. Okay, so. This is the expected goals chart. So I can tell you, in this blue zone here, there's a 33% chance of every shot to go in. The yellow zone, 18%, red zone, 10%. So what does that mean? Everything outside of that, so every free kick Andrea Perlo has scored in his career outside here, he probably should have passed. Okay, he's saying that from a, from a, from a run of play, it's gonna generally be a waste of possession. Okay, so, we should look to pass or create a further avenue to create an opportunity. Statistically, in over 1.5 million shots, okay? I'd let you formulate your own opinions on that. I believe it's quite solid, and I believe a lot of the chances, although, and the emotion of the game kind of takes over you in these situations. Um, okay, was it the right decision? And when we get to a stage, which I'll talk about later, we can quantify, qualify um, location, and look at that, this, I think, will become even more solid. Expected goals then, so what do we get out of looking at expected goals? What do we get from this, from this st uh, statistic? We get, did we deserve to win the game? And I'll show you a couple of graphs and a couple of tables in a second. How is our team performing in attack, and, uh, in attack and in defense? So how are we performing when we score? How are we, we con uh, performing from a defensive perspective? And this is a big one for me, because we can do all the work we want from a statistical point, if we can't impact practice, we can't impact training, we can't impact the 11 players that take, and the 18 players in the squad that take to the field every game day, then what's the point? Okay, so we need to be able to influence and create something where this analysis works and is conducive with how our coaches work and can affect our players as well. So, 
I'll go back to this little graph here. We decided that we can't really improve performance directly just off looking these metrics. Okay, so from an expected goals perspective, from this same game, we were expected to, to have scored 1.1 goals compared to Orlando City's 0.9, one goal. So you're taking all their chances, all their shots, everything we spoke about here, and they were only expected, and they were expected to score one goal. We were expected to concede 1.1, although we've been dominant in every other aspect of the game. Okay? Why is that? So this is um, a chance timeline. So look at all our attempts in blue, and all Orlando's in yellow. So this maps out in relation to the time of the game, where we've had our chances, and the value of each chance that we have created, or each shot we have had, the value of what is expected to be, uh, to be a goal. Okay? So you can see, it took us, to get to this point, just over 50 minutes to get to a similar level of Orlando's chance. The chance they've created, 60% chance of scoring. Okay? And over the course of the game, it took us over 80 minutes. When you look at how dominant we were, it took us 80 minutes to get to the same level that Orlando's chances were. Although we've had we control possession from possession stat, we've been in there half, half the amount of time with the ball than we did without it. It took us 80 minutes to get there. So this provokes further, further, um, further questioning. We take it this, we can use this as a good guide of the periods where we've been quite dominant, but we've created chances that haven't been that high in quality, should we say. So this next one. Now we're looking at where our shots were from. So relative, if you remember the map I showed you with the, the circles of the blue, red, and yellow zones. Looking at the types of chances we've had. All inside the box, these are the eight shots, compared to Orlando's one chance and how good this chance was for them to score. But as you can see, we've had one shot inside the blue zone, which is 33% chance of scoring. We've had three shots inside the yellow zone, which is 54% chance of scoring. So them, two, them attempts combined probably gives us that goal we should have scored to tie the game. So we created them similar chances there, and we think, okay, we can look at them chances in a little bit more detail. How did we create them chances? Why did we not score? Outside of that, we had four in the red zone, which is 40% chance of scoring, but obviously we need to look at them in a little bit more detail as well. So now looking at everything combined, our expected goals, knowing what we, understanding what expected goals and how we formulate and calculate it is, looking at the chance timeline and the types of chances we've conceded there, can we start to make a few tactical decisions now, or can we start to inform the process? Yes, no? What do you think? going into a little bit more detail and we can quantify a little bit better and have a better understanding of the types of chances we created in relation to our dominance. Can we now start to formulate a tactical thing? Say, say that again, sorry? Some actionable intelligence now so that we can say, okay, uh, you know, when, when you have the ball, then, you know, unless it's a really good opportunity, start passing in you know, outside that zone, for example. Yeah. Yes, so now we, we have a better understanding, we have a better, um, we're better educated in what we need to do, where we want to go, how we want to do that. Yeah, okay, definitely, 100%. But again, for me, tactically, we still can't really influence. We still can't really influence from this. We have a better, deeper understanding, and it's pointing us in a direction. And it's pointed us in a direction where we can do this. Start reviewing specific footage. So it's given us a real full understanding of where our chances have come from, the quality of them chances, and point us in the direction of the areas relative to the timeline, where we need to look, how we need to look. Okay? So we go back and we review this, and then this would work on specific technical and tactical content during training sessions. So that was point us in that direction to use the video to then say, okay, so these chances we created, which had 33% chance of, of being converted, what kind of chance was it? And how did we create that chance in the context of that game? So then we can look at that chance. Was there ways that we could create better chances? Or how did we create that chance? And then we look at the other the chances that weren't maybe so good. And why, why was that? Why was that? So it's provoking us and looking at us in um, a different perspective. So this is where we are now in relation to expected goals. So expected goals in the league, we have the highest. Highest in MLS. So about, of all the chances we've created, of all the analysis that we've looked at, after all the um, chances during the season, we've gone through, we've had a look, we've seen where, I'm not going to tell you how, because I've given a lot of secrets away, but we've looked at how we create our chances. 
and now we're just above Chicago in terms of goals that we have expected to score, which is four less than what we have actually scored. So we're outperforming uh, what we are predicted to be and where we're supposed to be this season. But using this data to point us in the directions to guide us and to inform the coaches, um, we've been able to structure training, we've been able to use it as a, as a guiding principle. We've been able to use it to, to guide our focus on goal scoring and, and, and defending on a, really, on a really basic level. And our coaches take this information really, really well to come up with decisions like this. Because we're using their expertise from a, a soccer playing perspective and coaching perspective mixed with the data to come up with an objective viewpoint and standpoint of where to focus our attention. Because we want to focus our attention on the plays that are going to score us more goals and stop us conceding from a really obvious level. We want to focus on that and this and the data is giving us that direction to be able to focus. As well as taking on board the subjective feelings of the coaches from a tactical perspective, really, really important because they have really good experience, great experience in the game. And they know the game really, really well. So their intuition is not something that as data analysts and as performance analysts that we can ignore. No, no way, because their intuition and what they feel about the game, how they see the game is really, really important. But we, from an, an objective standpoint, need to use this to help, okay, is this correct? If it's not, how can we look at a, a way of saying, okay, from an objective standpoint, this is what we need to do. This is how we need to do it. Okay, and then you come together and it's a, it's a really, really strong working relationship what myself, Dave Lee, have with the coaches of, the, of NYCFC. So just to finish, data analytics and where next. So I alluded to it before with location of players and being able to map from a technical standpoint where they are on the field and how their relationships integrate with each other and how my movement five yards forward could influence your movement five yards backwards. How does that then result in um, creating a goal scoring opportunity? And this is XY coordinate data, location data is what we're calling it. This company's called TrackAb that are uh, um, trialing in the Premier League this type of data. So we're on the cusp of it to be able to really solidify everything that we do from a uh, data perspective and to be, have a little bit more um, predictive analysis of what could actually happen. So try and map it out from a real objective standpoint of what is going on from a numbers perspective. When we get this XY data, it's going to be really, really exciting for the sport. And you'll see a, a massive boom and a massive change in how data analytics is perceived in the outside wider community. So we're still we're looking for this. And um, MLS, we're not started trialing it yet. But as a group, CFG, from a research perspective, we're leading the way in, in Europe and in England on trying to get this and push this forward and try trialing different algorithms, trialing different software companies, just to see where we are at with this, the location data. Because once we get that from a technical perspective and comparing the interactions of every single player on the field <coughs> and have, imagine an Excel data sheet with millions and millions and millions of rows, being able to go through that on how each player's movement has affected the next players, then we really start to see the game from a tactical perspective and it really starts to relate to numbers as well. 